Muy buenos días a todos. Es para mí un gusto muy grande inaugurar la serie Fronteras en Sistemática, Biodiversidad y Evolución del Instituto de Biología de la UNAM. Durante mucho tiempo, eh, un grupo de personas teníamos la idea, estábamos muy entusiasmados en establecer una serie de seminarios de altísimo nivel sobre temas de la sistemática en su sentido más amplio, incluyendo los estudios de la biodiversidad bajo un enfoque evolutivo y sus consecuencias en la sociedad y el bienestar humano. Estos temas representan la personalidad y la vocación distintiva del Instituto de Biología y podríamos decir que son su esencia. La serie que el día de hoy estamos inaugurando se va a llevar a cabo de manera anual durante el primer semestre del año. Esta serie que estamos iniciando el día de hoy es la primera y en esta ocasión incluye solamente a seis ponentes y es realizada de manera virtual, naturalmente debido a las condiciones de pandemia en la que nos encontramos, pero planeamos realizar esta serie de manera presencial y aumentar el número de ponentes. Todos nosotros sabemos que eh, el contar con un ponente de manera presencial no solamente nos permite tener la charla, eh, disfrutar la ponencia, pero también permite la ventaja adicional de interactuar directamente con él o con la ponente y sobre todo de tener una interacción más cercana con la idea de que el ponente permanezca en nuestro, en nuestro instituto por uno o dos días interactuando con los académicos y de manera muy importante con los estudiantes. Buscamos presentar enfoques integrativos y de frontera que sean presentados por líderes, líderes mundiales en el campo. En, este, en esta primera serie contamos con seis ponentes de una calidad y trayectoria académica sobresaliente. El día de hoy, el lunes 22 de febrero, contamos eh, con gran placer con la presencia de la doctora Rebeca Zafra de la Universidad de Colorado, que nos va a hablar sobre el papel de la adaptación en la divergencia del fenotipo y la especiación. El martes 9 de marzo, eh, tengo el gran gusto de que esté con nosotros el profesor Peter Crane, que actualmente es el director de la Oak Spring Garden Foundation, pero también estuvo en la Universidad de Yale, fue director del Jardín Botánico de Kew y también estuvo en el Field Museum y la Universidad de Chicago. Y él nos va a presentar una experiencia personal y eh, direcciones prometedoras sobre las relaciones entre las plantas con semilla. El martes 23 de marzo nos va a acompañar el profesor Tim Baraclow de la Universidad de Oxford, quien nos va a hablar sobre la transferencia horizontal de genes y su impacto en la especiación en eucariotes. El martes 13 de abril va a estar con nosotros la doctora Ana Carnaval de la City University of New York, hablando de la bio biogeografía histórica y la biodiversidad en el eh, bosque de lluvia atlántico de Brasil. El martes 27 de abril va a estar con nosotros el profesor Rolf Beutel, que nos va a hablar de la sistemática de los insectos, desde Hennig hasta los transcriptomas, y para cerrar esta primera serie, va a estar con nosotros el profesor Enrico Cohen del John Innes Center en el Reino Unido, hablando sobre la evolución y el desarrollo de la diversidad de especies. Quisiera hacer una invitación muy amplia a nuestra comunidad académica y estudiantil para que para la próxima serie que se va a llevar a cabo en el 2022, por favor nos hagan llegar con anticipación sugerencias de ponentes a quienes podemos invitar para esta segunda serie. Sin más, deseo agradecer muy ampliamente al comité organizador de esta serie Fronteras, formada por los doctores Ulises Rosas, Alejandra Moreno y Lázaro Guevara. También quiero agradecer a los académicos del Instituto de Biología que atendieron a la invitación y nos hicieron propuestas de ponentes. Y finalmente quiero hacer un agradecimiento muy grande a los compañeros del Instituto de Biología que nos han proporcionado su invaluable apoyo técnico. Al maestro Jorge López y a los diseñadores Julio César Montero y Diana Martínez Almaguer. Sin más, con mucho gusto, doy la palabra a la doctora Alejandra Moreno, quien nos va a hacer la presentación 
de la ponente del día de hoy. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Susana. Pues el día de hoy tenemos el honor de presentar a la profesora Rebeca Joe Safran eh, de la Universidad de Colorado. Ella eh, estudió su licenciatura eh, con el tema de ecología en la Universidad de Michigan. Hizo su maestría en biología de vida silvestre en la Universidad Estatal Humboldt y eh, su doctorado en ecología y biología evolutiva en la Universidad de Cornell. Su principal área de investigación es el papel de la adaptación en modelar la variación fenotípica entre poblaciones cercanamente emparentadas. Y como ecóloga evolutiva, ella utiliza métodos moleculares, comparativos y experimentales para determinar la función de ciertos caracteres y cómo éstas afectan el flujo génico, utilizando a las golondrinas comunes como modelo. Este sistema es fácilmente monitoreable, abundante y muy diverso. La profesora Safran tiene docenas de artículos publicados y más de 5,000 citas y una de sus principales eh, líneas es la, la especiación. Entonces, le damos la palabra a la de, doctora Safran. You can share your screen, Rebecca. Hey. Yes, thank you so very much for this very wonderful in, invitation. I am honored um, to be with you, at least virtually. And I am very happy to present a bit of the work that my lab has been doing uh, for the past few decades. Um, before I get started, I'd like to just uh, acknowledge many of the students and postdocs, as well as my husband and my children for being wonderful collaborators um, as I talk about their their work and our various collaborations. I'll introduce them one at a time, but just to give you a sense that this work uh, is not possible without many wonderful students and collaborators um, and family members who help support uh, the family while I'm off um, traveling to do some of the science. So my, my deep uh, thanks uh, to everyone. And again, my, my thank you for uh, the invitation for this. Um, for this, uh, for this lecture. So I'm gonna talk about the process of speciation today. And the question of how we study speciation is a really fundamental one in evolutionary biology. And I think I'm drawn to this question because there's no one right way to answer it. There's many different ways and, and methods and inroads to thinking about the patterns and processes that are related to the study of speciation. And some of the most prevalent models include features related to time and space. So if we think about Ernst Meyer's um, uh, model of allopatric speciation, we start with a population of individuals that freely interbreed with one another some sort of barrier arises such that populations become geographically isolated from one another. And as we think about the time course in which these populations are traveling, um, they may actually stop here such that populations remain geographically isolated. And this, I would argue, is a place where many species become formed in geographic isolation and where this process across time and space stops. However, bio biologists are very interested in places where populations may come back into secondary contact after these barriers um, are removed. And in the case that populations do come into secondary contact, there may have been enough time apart from one another such that when they return, together in uh, a place where they can interact, they remain evolutionarily separate. In other cases, perhaps if not a lot of time or divergence has occurred, these populations may be side by side, but hybridize um, during some part of their distribution. And perhaps in cases where these populations have spent time apart, in really ecologically similar situations and or not a lot of time and separation has occurred, these populations may come back together and freely interbreed again. And there's many different ways to study the origin of species from genetic and behavioral 
and all, all sorts of ecological uh, perspectives. And many of that great work is happening um, at your institute. It was really lovely to get this invitation and to learn more about all of the, the fantastic work happening there. So in terms of the origin of species, we've made a lot of progress in understanding the evolutionary history of genes and the populations that carry them. And we've also been able to place uh, populations and species and their various characters and their environmental contexts in very nice evolutionary uh, history perspectives through phylogenetics and phylogenomics so that we've understood progress in evolutionary history of groups and the traits that evolve along with them. To answer the question of what processes underlie patterns of diversification is a little bit trickier and requires that we take these beautiful signatures or patterns of evolutionary history and get some more insights into how we can actually understand the processes that led to these emerging patterns of these distinct evolutionary lineages and the features that represent them. So these phylogenetic hypotheses are incredible and important patterns of one timestamp, but they do not allow us to test the direct processes that led to these patterns as we see them now. In many speciation studies, we are interested in patterns of phenotype divergence, population genetic divergence, and we organize our understanding of organisms using these phylogenomic approaches. And at the same time, evolutionary biologists use tools of genetics and think about the environmental context in which populations are evolving and processes related to selection and or neutral evolutionary processes to understand how and why phenotype variation is what it is in closely related populations. I'm really interested in the crosstalk between these different scales of analysis. So on the one hand, our group is obsessed with understanding phenotype evolution within closely related populations. And then we're also interested in thinking about all of these processes at work in these closely related populations and how that helps us understand these larger patterns of populations in terms of phenotype and population genetic divergence. And it's in my mind that these connections allow us to examine and predict process um, and their emerging patterns. So how in the world do we do this? Well, we need to go back to these fundamental elements of the speciation cycle, time and space, and choose study systems that allow us to examine pattern and process across different time points in the speciation cycle. And here referring to populations that are geographically isolated, as well as populations that have had some secondary contact or encounters after some time in isolation. And so the way that we study the central question of adaptation across the speciation cycle is to choose a study system where we have closely related populations that have enough variation and phenotype and geographic isolation so that there's something to compare. And in doing so, we can conduct direct analyses of how and why populations are diverging at different points in the speciation cycle. And this allows us to examine process when populations are no longer side by side or they're geographically isolated from one another. And if lucky, it allows us to examine processes at work when populations are in various different points of secondary contact. So our work has been focused on the role of adaptation in speciation in the barn swallows. This is one of the most widespread of all vertebrates. You can see this cartoon distribution map where different colors represent the distributions of different subspecies across their massive um, geographic distribution. They occupy similar habitats, and that is primarily associated with human constructed uh, locations, sheds and bridges, and of course barns, where these animals build a mud cup nest. Um, an interesting thing about the barn swallows is that 
across these different subspecies, as you can see by these cartoonized um, images of a typical male from each population, is that there's interesting variation in plumage coloration, especially with respect to uh, breast coloration. There's interesting variation in morphology related to body size. And there's really interesting variation in the migratory behavior of these populations, such that these Middle Eastern populations are residents and don't undergo seasonal migrations, whereas these more Northern uh, subspecies undergo really long distant seasonal migrations into the Southern hemisphere. In terms of the phylogenetic hypothesis of this small group of six subspecies, about the only great signal we have is that indeed these six subspecies comprise a monophyletic clade. That is, each subspecies is more closely related to one another than either is to a member of uh, another member of the genus in which they reside. Um, but beyond that, this phylogenetic hypothesis is not very well resolved with a lot of polytomies um, present on either side of a fairly well resolved east west uh, subset of populations. And this split here, this, these east west clades, um, occurs right around here in terms of the distribution. And I think the thing that is really fascinating about um, this signal is that these relationships do not at all predict phenotype similarity. So um, in one side of the clade, it's not as if you have all of the pale colored individuals. You see dark coloration, intermediate coloration, and very pale coloration. Um, and the same goes for here. Uh, so we're seeing these traits sort of evolve uh, differently on either side of these two subclades. And again, that split spatially occurs right around here. So we study um, the role of adaptation using this really handy system. These are closely related populations. The phylogenetic hypothesis is not well resolved, which means that populations are still sorting. And I think that's a very interesting time to go in and do comparative work because then you can really start understanding the processes that are still ongoing in terms of whether these lineages will actually remain distinct or dissolve back uh, into one another. And so we use these patterns of a very recent rapid uh, divergence. Some of these subspecies are um, only thousands uh, of years, sort of in terms of their evolutionary history um, and divergence times. And because of the recency and the ability to compare these populations from a variety of temporal and spatial perspectives, we can go in and ask questions about how and why populations are diverging. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So for this talk, I'm going to organize it in terms of the work that we're doing within populations to understand how phenotypes and why phenotypes are evolving into different trait spaces. Um, and then we'll start traveling across this different speciation cycle to start understanding the connection of these processes at play with respect to phenotype evolution to help us better understand the larger patterns of phenotype divergence and population genetic divergence. So a typical toolkit for an ornithologist or a scientist studying birds is one that we employ. Um, we travel to breeding sites very early in the morning. These birds are among the first awake. They start shattering before dawn. So we are outside their nests or nesting locations with these fine mesh nets um, about an hour before dawn during the summer. Um, we can capture hundreds of birds in a day. They're very calm in hand and very willing participants in terms of the variety of morphological measurements we can take. We also collect uh, blood samples for a variety of physiological and genomic assays. We can individually mark birds so that we can place a male and a female attending a particular nest, and we can track the entire reproductive uh, season, and then also take measures from their shared offspring 
to figure out really the, the soap opera of the breeding season that has occurred because typically half of the number of nestlings that a male is caring for in his nest are sired by a neighboring male. In terms of phenotype evolution, I've shown you some cartoonized versions of a typical male across the different six subspecies, but of course we wanted to measure it just to make sure that we're actually comparing things that are quantitatively different from one another. So these are the typical measures that we take. We measure length of wing, we measure these uh, outer tail streamers, which work like rudders for these aerial insects as they aerial insectivores as they move through the sky um, in in uh, in search of food, and we collect uh, feather samples to um, measure them with a spectrophotometer um, across three different patches. In terms of tail streamer length, just showing you cartoons of males from the different six subspecies. And you can see that these populations are quantitatively different from one another and statistically significantly so. And I think the neat thing about this trait is that it's literally just being stretched uh, to either be longer or shorter in different populations. We're not replacing these phenotypes with something completely different. We're not talking about a loss or a gain, but we're literally talking about the same quantitative trait that is being pulled in different directions, um, the mechanisms of which we are uh, studying. The same goes for wing length. We have quantitative trait variation in wing length. Um, and these two traits are highly correlated, which makes sense because the tail streamer acts very much like a rudder for these populations um, that are in flight in search of the food that they catch on the wing. In terms of plumage coloration, I'm showing you a PC axis where lower uh, scores here are predictive of darker plumage coloration. As you can see, if you follow these lines all the way down to uh, the cartoon phenotype. And again, we have uh, the same trait that's being stretched uh, in different uh, ways, whether we have populations that are lighter or really dark. And I think when we look at these data in collection, one thing that is also fascinating is that these traits, plumage coloration, wing length, and tail streamer length, um, are not associated with one another. So that means that we have populations that are pale in coloration with really short tail streamers and populations with really uh, pale coloration and very, very long tail streamers, suggesting that these traits have different evolutionary trajectories themselves. So the first question we wanted to ask is, what signals are involved in mate selection decisions? When I first started studying barn swallows, I chose the system because a lot was known about sexual selection, in particular on tail streamer lengths. And this work comes from um, populations from continental Europe where it was known that males with uh, extremely long tail streamers are sort of the winners in terms of reproductive performance. But we wanted to start getting a sense for whether or not that relationship held across different populations with different average phenotypes. So we asked the question, does the use of these signals, we focused on tail streamer length and plumage color, does the use of these signals in a reproductive context vary among populations? One of the things that I love about the system, among many, um, is that we can manipulate these traits in really re realistic ways within different populations. So we can, um, we can reduce tail streamer length and we can increase tail streamer length in biologically relevant ways. And after about 20 attempts with different uh, colorants and, and inks, we found um, a pen, an art marker, non-toxic ink marker, art marker, that allows us to manipulate uh, plumage coloration, matching the spectral properties of naturally varying plumage coloration um, in males across all of these populations. So we can make males darker. We haven't figured out how to make males lighter without really abrading uh, the microstructure of, of plumage. So we are just tied to a darkening treatment here, um, but we can manipulate tail streamers to uh, shorten and elongate them 
So we've traveled across different subspecies um, to just simply ask, is there evidence of sexual selection on tail streamer lengths, on coloration, by conducting the same manipulative experiment in different subspecies? And what we find is evidence of divergent sexual selection, such that if you're in North America, where we've studied tail streamer lengths in three different populations now, it's the case that short uh, tail streamers are favored in terms of reproductive outcomes. And that darker coloration also has favorable reproductive outcomes for males. When we work in Central Europe, we find uh, similar to work that was done previously, that males with elongated tail streamers have greater reproductive success, um, but coloration does not seem to predict variation in reproductive success in these populations. When we travel to the Middle East, to these populations that are non-migratory, we find that our manipulations show that males with long tail streamers are favored and males with really dark coloration are, are favored. So females in that population seem to want it all. And the nice thing about the portrait that this presents is that these phenotype traits seem to be stretched in different ways that are representative of what we see in terms of patterns of divergence. And the way that they seem to be stretched seems to be underlain in part by female uh, mate choice. So where we have darker coloration favored, males on average have very fairly dark uh, plumage coloration relative to other subspecies, where we have experimental evidence of elongated tail streamers being favored, males have fairly long tail streamers relative to other species, subspecies, um, but plumage coloration is quite pale. And in the case of these Middle Eastern populations, we see typical phenotypes where males are very uh, dark in coloration and have long streamers. So this helps us explain this portrait of phenotype divergence. Another really interesting part of this uh, story of phenotype divergence is related to the work that Amanda Hunt did uh, during her P PhD dissertation in our group where she traveled to these different subspecies and she took a look at the parasites that were um, associated with these uh, aspects of phenotype. And what she found on the whole is that the most divergent traits that we had shown experimentally to be under divergent sexual selection also seemed to be advertising the costliest local parasite. So in other words, if you're in Colorado, our darkest males are appearing to advertise the degree to which their nests that they are defending are associated with mite populations that are very harmful to nestlings developing alongside those as well as malarial infections. When you travel to Europe, we find that tail streamer lengths and not any feature of plumage color is associated with the most costly parasites in that population. And then when we travel to the Middle East, we find that both coloration and tail streamer length seem to be predictive of the parasite loads of males or the parasites associated with the nest that he has secured in his territory. So this starts to place some of why females might be choosing different traits in an ecological context, but I'm sure that the study or that these uh, the actual underlying mechanisms are a lot more complicated than that. Another aspect of barn swallows is that they're highly social. And many of these birds live in high dense uh, colonies with dozens of other barn swallows. And we wanted to start understanding how that social environment mediated uh, reproductive transactions. And here I'm highlighting the work of Dr. Iris Levin, who came to my lab as a postdoc and pioneered the use of these proximity tags that both emit and record a unique signal such that by recording um, and deploying these tags in a fully marked population, we could start assembling a social network of understanding which individuals are close together. And because we had experimental evidence that plumage coloration is under strong selection in terms of uh, reproductive success in our Colorado population, 
we were interested in understanding whether social interactions were organized around this trait. So this is a social network of males shown in uh, gray and females shown in white circles where the thickness of the line connecting males and females is related to the number of times that these individuals interact with one another. In this network, we are showing really close range interactions um, on the order of five meters to 10 centimeters apart. And for an aerial insectivore that can basically fly wherever it would like at tremendous distances from their uh, nesting sites, we figured that these five meter to 10 centimeter interactions were slightly non-random. Although we don't know the exact nature of these interactions, we simply wanted to ask if males and females are more interactive with one another as a function of male color. So here's this male in this social network. And here he is, he's got the darkest plumage color in this particular network. And we find that the degree to which he interacts with other females is a lot greater compared to paler males in the network, suggesting that there's something about social interactions and plumage coloration that are associated with one another. But we wanted to look at this experimentally. And so what we did is we looked at a social network before we changed a male's coloration. And then we looked at it after we ch changed a male's coloration to see if the degree to which a male interacts with other females in the population is can be changed. On this axis here, we show change in ventral plumage color. If you capture a naturally dark male and give him a layer of this non-toxic permanent ink marker, he doesn't change in plumage color that much. He gets a little bit darker, but um, sort of maxes out at, at the level of this uh, ink marker. But if you take a pale male and you apply a layer of ink, he changes in plumage color quite a bit. And this is concomitant with the degree to which he changes how interactive he is with his social mate, as well as other females in the population, suggesting that changes in color is causally associated with the way a male interacts with females in uh, this population. So in terms of the phenotype evolution part, I've shown you that there are features of the environment and features of individual phenotype that shape patterns of reproductive success as a function of phenotype divergence. Um, and that it could be likely, very likely a, a combination of both local e ecological context, parasites, as well as female choice or male-male competition that is explaining how these populations are diverging um, in terms of their average phenotypes. And we've been talking about populations that are geographically isolated from one another. And I next want to sort of start talking about the larger scale patterns of this phenotype evolution to simply ask, do these differences in phenotype explain patterns in the way populations are becoming genetically divergent from one another? To do this work, we grabbed a number of populations that we had on hand uh, geographically isolated from one another, different replicates of subspecies, representations of, of most of the subspecies, except for this North Asian one, which uh, will come up soon. And we simply wanted to ask about the relationship between phenotype and uh, genomic uh, structure. And the way we did this is we built uh, these matrices of all pairwise combinations of phenotype differences. So Rustica compared to um, our Israeli population, Rustica compared to a South Asian population, Rustica compared to a continental North American population, and looked at all pairwise differences in plumage coloration, in wing length, in tail streamer length, as well as the extent to which these populations are geographically isolated from one another, and simply asked, are these differences in population genetic structure uh, 
a function of space that is just being far apart from one another? Or are these differences being built up as a function of selection that is differences in phenotype that we see in these closely related populations? And what we found um, by looking at these patterns of phenotype and genomic uh, differentiation is that Again, we see that there's evidence of rapid phenotype divergence. I've already shown you a phylogenetic hypothesis that's very messy, suggesting that there's a lot of incomplete lineage sorting happening. The pairwise FST between all of these populations is about 0 0.002. Pairwise FST uh, varies between zero and one. So uh, what we're what we're seeing is that we have very very closely related populations again confirming that phylogenetic hypothesis and that it's the most divergent traits turns out to be plumage color that is explanatory of genomic divergence and that it's trait divergence not simply geographic isolation that explains patterns of genome-wide divergence so what we are inferring from this closely related group of populations and the very shallow genomic divergence that we see in terms of their relatedness to one another is that it's not so much time and space that is explaining these degree of genomic divergence, but it's actually differentiation in phenotype that appears to be most predictive of genome-wide divergence. Okay, well, We've been talking about uh, this part of the speciation cycle, where we've been talking about divergent selection on phenotype traits, and the fact that divergent selection is associated with population level uh, genomic divergence, more so than just distance. But we also wanted to see if we could find locations across the distribution of these populations where these populations are overlapping with one another. And so if we had to map out places to do these expeditions, it would place us somewhere along here. Remember that um, phylogenomic split between sort of the Eastern and Western subclades of this really small uh, group of subspecies occurs right about here. And so we travel to these parts of the world. Um, every little spot here on the map is a location where a postdoc in the group, Liz Gordado and her team, and sometimes me, were able to travel and collect uh, samples on um, different uh, phenotypes and collect samples for uh, population genomics and collect samples for inferring something about migratory behavior, which I'll talk about in just a moment. So what did Liz find? She found that as she traveled from Moscow um, all the way across Siberia, that there appeared to be um, intermediates or hybrid zone here, just west of Lake Baikal. She found another uh, potential hybrid zone here as she traveled farther east. Um, she found a three-way hybrid zone in central uh, Mongolia. And then as she traveled across the Yellow River Valley in the Gansu province of China, uh, yet another location that appeared to have intermediate phenotypes. But of course, we wanted to look at uh, genomics to better understand the degree to which ancestry varied uh, along with phenotype. And so we had 100 and about 1,300 individuals for which we developed genomic resources, um, placed uh, SNPs aligned to a draft barn swallow genome, um, and analyzed phenotype measures, as well as the use of isotopes uh, to infer migratory behavior. So the handy thing about barn swallows, um, there are many handy things about the system, but one of the other handy things about them is that they basically redevelop all of their feathers in a non-breeding location. So in a breeding location, they're basically displaying plumage that they constructed 
in a non-breeding season in the Southern hemisphere. And because keratin, which is the backbone of these plumage-based traits, integrates various stable isotopes in it, we can look at the stable isotopes in plumage that's being expressed um, in the breeding season and infer something about where in the world these traits were developed such that we can start connecting the migratory pathways of these populations uh, between the breeding and non-breeding season. So when Liz put together all of the genomic data and came up with this sort of heat map of continent-wide distributions of ancestry coefficients, what we're finding is that these pure parental species shown in red and shown in yellow and shown in blue all seem to be moving towards this central location here where these populations are colliding into one another and where the ancestries are indicative of admixture or hybridization. So that was exciting for several reasons. One, it confirmed that we do have these hybrid zones, which are just these great natural experiments for understanding what happens when populations from different ancestries with different phenotypes collide into one another. Another really fascinating thing about this finding is that it all kind of stacks up right here at about 110 degrees. So the questions we asked here are, do the phenotype differences that have evolved in geographic isolation restrict, restrict gene flow when those populations come back into secondary contact? And to measure this, we use geographic Klein analyses, which are really handy for inferring the role of selection um, alongside with patterns of gene flow. And just to orient you to the graphs that I'll show you from our uh, various hybrid zones across Eurasia, what we basically did was walked across a geographic uh, transect across space and looked at um, the degree to which ancestry or the frequency of a trait moved across that geographic transect. In cases where you have a really, really steep transition or a steep climb, we can infer that there's very strong selection against hybridization. And in a case where you have a really steep, just straight up line transition here, you can also infer that there's no gene flow happening, strong selection against gene flow, such that these populations are sitting side by side with one another, but they're fairly independent or reproductively isolated. Um, in cases where you see sort of a more gradual cline, you can infer that there's some selection against hybridization, and yet that there's still some gene flow. We don't have this sort of straight line uh, pattern here, indicating that these populations are side by side, but some members of them are interbreeding with one another. And in cases where you just have no differentiation either in ancestry or any of the traits you're measuring, you can infer that there's low or no selection against uh, mating between these two subspecies, inferring that there's lots and lots of gene flow. So to go back to that map and to look at these different uh, hybrid zones and the phenotypes that uh, are occurring at these collision points, we looked at these geographic clines to get a sense for what was impeding or facilitating gene flow. In these populations just uh, west of Lake Baikal, we see that an ancestry cline moves across space that has an inflection point that is concomitant with plumage color and carbon ratio, which we infer as a uh, a role of plumage coloration and migratory behavior being involved in selection against hybridization. As we move farther south, we see similar but sort of messier relationships, but still the involvement of carbon ratio and ventral color as we move across this ancestry cline, suggesting that these two traits are involved um, in some degree of reproductive isolation. And then as we move into the Yellow River Valley in China, 
we see an ancestry decline that is a little bit um, off balance, not completely concomitant with an advancing decline in plumage coloration and carbon ratio. Again, suggesting that something about migratory behavior and maybe plumage color is involved in gene flow here. When Liz walked uh, east of these transects, we found that all of these clines basically are fairly flat. Lots of evidence of gene flow, very low evidence of any reproductive isolation. And so the interesting thing here is that the consequences of secondary contact really were variable depending on the degree of phenotype divergence, such that if you have really, really strong plumage divergence and variation in migratory behavior, you would have a greater degree of isolation such that there's very low degrees of hybridization. We have populations also, such as the ones in the Yellow River Valley, where plumage divergence is fairly shallow. Migratory behavior seems to be playing a role in gene flow. And the formation of a hybrid zone is what we are seeing. Um, and we also found populations on sort of the eastern side of these transects that seem to be completely admixed with one another, such that these populations have very low degrees of reproductive isolation. So the consequences of uh, secondary contact in terms of reproductive isolation appear to be strongly related to the phenotypes that are colliding in those locations. And a basic pattern that kept coming up again and again is that migratory differences appeared to be associated with these reproductive barriers. So we wanted to take a closer look at that. And to do so, um, we returned to the Yellow River Valley, this little sliver of land in the Gansu province here, where our ancestry estimates were uh, co concomitant with variation in carbon ratio, again, suggesting something about migratory behavior. Um, and we, along with Sheila Turbeck, a former PhD candidate in my lab, deployed these light level sensors um, on birds across this transect in the hopes of recovering them the year after. These light level sensors are really cool. We place them on the bird very much like a backpack. And if we're lucky enough to have them return, um, and we can grab these tags uh, off these birds again to analyze the data, we can infer something about the seasonal movements and the timing of these birds rather than just in inferring um, the non-breeding location uh, from isotope data alone. So in terms of the geolocator tracks across the Yellow River Valley, we have subspecies that are more um, European-like in terms of their ancestry. And we have subspecies that are more sort of Asian-like in their ancestry. And we simply wanted to ask, are these populations, as would be indicated by the isotope data, are these populations going to different non-breeding locations? And the answer is these rustica-like populations are going all the way to Central Eastern Africa and these Asian-like populations are staying within Asia um, and heading south, uh, in this case, to Sri Lanka. And these, this is pretty awesome, suggests that we have populations that are um, forming a migratory divide. And the migratory distance of these populations, even some of them that are side by side, are really, really different from one another. Populations that are more European-like are traveling uh, about three times, at least two times longer distance-wise than populations in Asia. The arrival times are several weeks later in terms of uh, establishment of breeding locations. Um, and so something about the ancestry then um, of these different subspecies appears to be strongly related to migratory behavior. So we are going to be returning back to these locations here, bringing uh, the, the social proximity tag so that we can look at behavioral interactions, bringing um, all of the tools that we use to manipulate phenotype,
and situating ourselves in um, this uh, Gansu transect to start asking questions about the experiments, uh, uh, experimental evidence for what is causing patterns of gene flow or limiting patterns of gene flow in this region. And so that takes us back to these locations um, in the Yellow River Valley or the Gansu province. Uh, this, um, this transect is located above uh, the Tibetan Plateau and south of the Gobi Desert, um, just east of the Taklamakan Desert. And this ancestry transect, ancestry trans, ancestry transect uh, basically suggests that it's Zhang Ye right at this interesting collision point along this geographic uh, transect where we have the greatest degree of admixed individuals as well as some parental uh, phenotypes. And the wonderful thing about this region, just looking at it from Google Earth, is that you have all of these villages that are surrounded by agricultural land. And these villages are constructed out of the same material. Um, and when you zoom into them, you see that uh, all of these villages are fairly conserved in terms of the, the ecological matrix that surrounds them. Again, agricultural land, same uh, human constructed structures. And then when you go uh, to these villages and look at the front doors of these various um, uh, residences, you see that there's barn swallow nests basically at many of them. And these are very much welcomed by the residents. Residents uh, will decorate these nests in, in the hopes of attracting them. And these are very highly revered symbols of spring. And so the wonderful thing about this landscape is that we can use these villages as an experimental uh, unit and we can conduct phenotype manipulations and we can place these proximity tags um, in the context of looking at patterns of gene flow and ask questions about the degree of social interactivity uh, to look at patterns, direct patterns of which individuals, which phenotypes are responsible for gene exchange between different subspecies. So if we ever get to go back to China, this is what we'll be doing. Um, but just to summarize the system, um, I've shown you that phenotype evolution within populations seems to be uh, leading to this pattern of di divergent sexual selection, as well as divergent ecological selection as a function of parasite populations, such that the phenotype evolution work that we've been doing helps us explain why overall there's patterns of phenotype divergence among these closely related species. And that selection and, and geographic isolation at this point in the speciation cycle appears to be related to mate selection, parasites, and migratory behavior. The process is dependent on the local environment and phenotype divergence is predictive of the very shallow but present degree of population genomic divergence among these populations. And then when we look across Asia, we can recover all three patterns of what might happen should these populations collide into one another and that the selection and isolation um, that brings these divergent phenotypes into contact zones helps us to understand whether there's going to be strong reproductive isolation or not, such that the degree of gene flow in secondary contact is dependent on the degree of phenotype divergence. Um, and this allows us to sort of look at the pattern and process relationships across different spatial and temporal perspectives to better understand that on the whole, pattern and process um, are differing across the speciation cycle in these really closely related, but really massively distributed uh, group of animals. Um, I want to thank you so very much for the kind invitation to speak with you today. I want to thank, of course, my funding sources, um, NSF, the National Science Foundation has been hugely generous and we are great, grateful and appreciative. Um, I want to thank the artist, Hilary Byrne, who has been so generous in allowing me to use her paintings throughout this talk and throughout our work. 
and the many collaborators, graduate students, postdocs, who have enabled uh, all of the work throughout the years. So thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Uh, now we follow with some questions. We already have a few. I'm going to show them on the screen. Uva Mergia Madrid asks, um, I guess you can prove or disprove the hamilton tuck hypothesis. Yeah, so Amanda Hund was really interested in thinking about uh, Hamilton Zuck in a comparative context. Um, and what she did find is that, um, you know, there was some evidence that the most, uh, you know, distinct aspects of phenotype were seeming to be uh, reflective of the most costly parasites in those different populations. So despite the fact that these traits are very similar, right, tail streamer length is short or it's long, it's not being replaced by another trait, we have local parasite populations that are associated with this trait that one could infer would be informative to females in the context of mate selection, as predicted by Hamilton Zuck. Very interesting. Um, another question, Gabriela Castellanos, um, have you considered assessing the correlation between epigenetic variation and phenotypic variation and adaptation, given the low genetic differentiation among subspecies? Thank, thank you, Gabriela. That is a terrific question. Um, and the answer is that um, something I didn't get to tell you about is that nestlings um, have plumage coloration that is reflective of the plumage coloration they will develop, eventually develop as adults. So we can use nestlings as this really neat experimental unit to look at the development of a relevant plumage-based trait. And we can do so in the context of experimental manipulations of brood size, as well as parasites. And work being done by Amanda Hund is showing that there is some upregulation and variation in the degree of gene expression related to melanogenesis, depending on whether you're exposed to a lot of parasites um, early in your life or not. So I think that's going to be a really big and important part of phenotype divergence. And I think the thing that we've puzzled over is, okay, so these individuals that are living with parasites very early um, in their lifetime, develop paler plumage coloration, but why is it that they stay on that trajectory of really pale plumage coloration throughout their lives? So that's sort of this idea of these cascading effects of early life conditions. Um, lots more to unpack there, but I, I agree with you. I think that um, that epigenetics and, and dif differential patterns of uh, gene expression are going to be very important part of the story as well. Thank you. Uh, I think this is Mark Olson. Um, he said, you said high levels of comparative data do not test co causes of diversification. So how are we to test the notion that population level processes plausibly explain patterns at vast phylogenetic scales? I think um, very strongly that you, if you want to make inferences about pattern and process, it's helpful to use really messy phylogenetic trees. For example, if you have a beautifully resolved phylogenetic hypothesis for a group of organisms that you'd like to compare, and you want to infer something about the processes or mechanisms at play that led to these beautifully resolved lineages, it may be the case that what you're measuring now had nothing to do with the processes that led to those patterns of divergence. What you are instead measuring perhaps is the maintenance of the phenotype for, uh, divergence that you're measuring at this current, current point in time. But if you're interested in all the evolution that's happening as the, those lineages diverge, I would advocate that you'd want to really catch kind of these subspecies in the act of uh, evolving from one another or dissolving into one another to, to really get in there at a relevant time scale to ask what mechanisms are at play here in divergence? Um, that's a great question. I'm happy to talk more about it. So feel free to reach out. It's a very interesting thing. Um, Hernan Vasquez Miranda 
Great talk, Rebecca. You mentioned plumage traits are driven by female choice correlated to parasite load. So parental imprinting of the daughters from their father's looks is not playing a role? So paternal imprinting could still be playing a role because in these geographically isolated populations, all the nestlings are exposed primarily to their, their dad's phenotype, right? Um, and we haven't done an experiment to really decouple that. So a great experiment to do in this case to start decoupling that would be to manipulate a paternal phenotype such that he looks like another subspecies entirely. Um, and I, you know, I, th I think that that would be a very interesting and fascinating um, experiment. The only issue is that we would then have to track those female offspring to see how they're making uh, mate selection decisions in the next generation and also have those additional uh, phenotypes available for her to choose from. And I think the hybrid zones are going to be really, really fun and interesting to start decoupling this. So in the Yellow River Valley, the phenotypes that are most divergent there are migratory behaviors. And we have no idea if social pairs are comprised of different subspecies taking different migratory trajectories. Given the timing of arrival, that's not likely to be the case, but it is a place where we'll be able to start looking at what females are exposed to, um, who really sired uh, that female and how mate selection decisions, if we can capture them in the next generation, play out. And that, that, is, that is a limitation as well, is tracking these offspring from one generation to uh, the decisions that they would make as adults because the return rates of offspring uh, to the populations in which they were born are quite low. That's a great question. Thank you. Uh, and Hernan asks again, also Roy Orr uh, et al, 2010 phylogeny was estimated with a handful of loci. Have you tried using your genomic data to boost the resolution of the phylogeny? Absolutely. So we are, and by we, I mean uh, a really talented uh, graduate student in my group, uh, Javon Carter, and a postdoc, Drew Shield, are putting together um, uh, genomic data to uh, to reconstruct the phylogenetic hypothesis for this group. So indeed, the 2010 phylogeny um, was very similar to a previous one and added just a, a handful of nuclear intron data with typical mitochondrial loci that, that one would employ around that time. Um, but we are now looking at a variety of different uh, data types, um, pulling from our large uh, genomic database to, to reconstruct and to see if we can find any more resolution. Um, the answer so far is no, those polytomies seem to be real uh, the structure that we show in the mitochondrial uh, phylogeny seems to be for the moment holding. Interesting. Uh, Bibian Nunes asks, have you ever observed any degree of fluctuating asymmetry within certain populations, tail feather plumage? That's a, that's a great question. Thank you. So the idea of fluctuating asymmetry is that, especially with respect to tail streamers, you know, that you would have a male whose, you know, streamers were sort of you know, really, really asymmetric or, or very different from one another. And that could be a signal of maybe developmental instability. Um, we have measured differences in tail streamer length and typically they are asymmetric or different because one has broken. Um, and in the case where we have two naturally sort of unbroken streamers that appear to be off, we have not yet found any signal um, of those individuals suffering in a, a mate selection context. Um, hard, to, hard to study asymmetry in plumage coloration because this is really um, a centrally located uh, patch of color. But yeah, great question. We have not been able to find uh, patterns of fluctuating asymmetry that other research, researchers in, Europea, uh, in European populations have shown previously. Thank you. Uh, that's the questions that we have in the comment section. If there is nothing else, I would like to ask you one question. 
You mentioned that half of the chicks in a nest are not sired by the male raising them. Have you found any uh, phenotypic differences among those chicks? Are the females choosing different males with different traits? Or why? what would be the advantage of having yeah, this great. arrangement? That, that's a great question. So what are the benefits to females of mating multiply, right? Um, I mean, why stray from your social male and have a brood of offspring that are sired by sometimes as many individuals as offspring that you have? We've seen cases where we have five nestlings and these are sired by five different males. Um, that is not an easy question to answer. Um, there are all sorts of hypotheses about immune system variation that could be helpful that we haven't studied yet. Um, we are, when we're able to assign the male that has sired those particular offspring, we tend to see that in our Israeli populations, for example, those males are darker and have longer tail streamers and those traits have a heritable component. So we could be looking at sort of a sexy sun kind of uh, benefit such that females are trying to make sure that their males are going to, going to be competitive in the future. Um, but that's, you know, that's that's still up for debate. And that's a, that's a really helpful question. Thank you. Very interesting. We have some uh, comment here, more than a question. It says, beautiful work. Thanks for the talk, Marcos Nama. And uh, if there are no more questions, or if Susana wants to say something, uh, we'll Thank you for your wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you for the kind invitation. It, it's been yeah, a pleasure. We're very, very grateful. I, um, I really hope to get to meet you all in person someday. And um, I wish you all the best through the pandemic. Um, and again, it's been an honor. Thank you very much. I would just like to add on, on behalf of the Institute of Biology that we are very grateful for the really amazing talk you just shared with us and congratulate you and your team for this really uh, outstanding work. And we certainly mm -hmm. hope we can invite you to come here to Mexico City, to the Institute, uh, to interact with us, with our students. We would be mostly delighted uh, when that happens. I, you so much, I, I will be there when I can. That, that just sounds absolutely fantastic. And I, I really look forward to interacting with you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for watching this presentation and we will be with you in the next talk of Fronteras de Sistemática Biodiversidad y Evolución. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.